I've never wanted to be famous. Like, I've never wanted to be, like, a famous guy. I don't really like the idea of going to a restaurant and being interrupted while I'm, like, hanging out mm. with people. Or that big, or feeling like you can't go anywhere. And I remember when I booked like, the Game of Thrones season that was going to happen. Crazy. Uh, you know, there was, that was, like, a huge deal. And there was, like, my mind was, like, just buzzing because I was just kind of like, whoa, I've just booked that. That's like, mm -hmm. I know what happens if you're in that, you know? I think my <laughs> life's about to change. Yeah, you ain't <laughs> yeah. walking down the street you know? anymore. Yeah, exactly. And that's like, you know, I was being like, well, I, I guess I'll enjoy these two years. Jay Sean's Basement Banter. All right, welcome, people. It is yet another episode of Basement Banter with your boy Jay Sean, me, Obs. Uh, here joined with my two... Buddies, the Woody and uh, Toddy Boy, how are we doing? Good man, good good. Oh yeah, Todd can't speak. He's got a fucking yeah. shit mic cable today. <laughs> <laughs> rubbish. He's got a rubbish mic cable. Um, that's sort of the level that we're at at the moment. You know what I mean? We couldn't even replace his mic cable before doing another podcast. But we're also um, upping that. We're sort of uh, we're sort of kind of got to the point where we're you know what are we fourteen in, fifteen in, and we've already got in. yeah. Already got sort of massive Hollywood stars now. So that's big where stars. we're at. Yeah, big stars. Big stars. <laughs> big stars. But annoying as well, because he's one of those sort of younger ones, better looking. You know what I mean? It's from London as well. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So let me, just, let me just give you a little brief. His name is Josh Whitehouse, actor, model, musician. You can catch him in his starring roles in Valley Girl and The Night Before Christmas on Netflix. Josh, what's going on, bro? Yo, how you doing, man? Oh, good, man. So, fellow, what, Brit? Not London. Where is it? London? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in the north, actually, and then I moved to London when I was about 18. Oh, okay. Got you. And, when you, and now you're in L.A., right? Currently in L.A., yeah. I came to L.A. just before the lockdown happened because I was supposed to be doing a TV show for Amazon out here, and uh, it started uh -huh. in January. And then kinda, I came back to see my family and get my passport renewed in March and then came back here, and ever since then I've been in quarantine. Oh my God. That's one of those unfortunate ones. And when you didn't think you're going to be here that long and now you're stuck. Yeah. But my girlfriend lives here. So, you know, it's been, oh, okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> beats, beats long distance. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> so I heard it there. I heard a bit of the accent, the pass, the passport, the passport. Yeah, my passport. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you something. I'll tell you who's probably equally as excited as all of the sort of young girls watching this is my daughter who is six and i'll tell you why oh, yeah. because we watched your night before christmas um night before christmas sorry yeah last christmas um oh, yeah we were watching that together <laughs> as a family i was paying more attention to vanessa hudgens to be honest just throwing <laughs> it out there she's very cute let's be honest little uh -huh. cutie um but we love that movie man it's like a perfect christmas <laughs> movie it's gonna be one of those Home Alone ones where you just watch it every Christmas. <laughs> Tell me about that, bro. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of a, a strange and uh, it was something I kind of realized only once we finished sort of making the movie. You know, it suddenly dawned on me what it meant when it was going to be released worldwide on Netflix, you know, kind of instant worldwide release. And I, and I think we were doing interviews and Vanessa was saying in one of the interviews, you know, like to be in a Christmas movie, you know, on Netflix, worldwide release, and, you know, being a part of people's living rooms year after year, and I suddenly just kind of, like, doing the maths in my head. I was like, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be quite a big movie. <laughs> yeah, man. Absolutely. Listen, um, you, cannot, you can't go wrong with those Christmas holiday movies, man. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun to get to play something kind of, you know, kind of silly and imaginative as well, like a time-traveling night from the 1800s. Uh, it was a lot of fun to me, it certainly appealed in a big way, and it was just like a really jolly thing to be a part of. And Vanessa was great to work with, you know, and Monica, the director, was awesome. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun, man, but hard as well, because we were Tell like, me why. Well, we were working, you know, there was a lot of night shoots, and we're out in Canada uh, in the sticks, in the snow till six o'clock in the morning and I'm like trudging around in a hundred pounds of armor kind of thing. Oh yeah, like that's right. A 14 hour shoot in a in hundred pounds of armor with snow falling on you. It gets pretty tricky after a bit. Well, see, that's funny because I would have totally assumed it would have been a lightweight suit and like not actual, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no. and it was a full thing, the full thing. <laughs> full thing, full thing. It was really, really, really heavy. And then oh, I had to wow. write a, 
I'm riding a horse wearing it as well. And, you know, like if I, if that horse just went slightly to the left or slightly to the right, I'd have just toppled. And like, I was like, if I fall wow. off this horse, I'm going to break my neck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some way to make sure I'm on solid, you know, but. Wow. Okay. So people like myself, obviously in the music, I have background in music. Um, I do music videos. I see that kind of set and I get it. And it's like a one or two day shoot and it's over. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't understand. It is, I am wiped, man, after, and that's just three minutes. <laughs> that's three <laughs> minutes of footage and I'm wiped. What is a typical day like uh, for you um, when you're doing sets? Can you break it down, the, the, the time lag between shots and stuff? Yeah. Really give people a, a picture, please, because I, even I'm interested. Um, a general day, I'd say you wake up at sort of, 5 a.m. and then you'll get yourself ready, get in a car by 6.30 and then be in hair and makeup probably for two hours. If you're like me, I've got tattoos, so people have to cover mm. your tattoos in some shots. Oh, wow. And then so you go through hair and makeup and that'll take you till about half past seven. Then you'll be going through uh, getting changed into your wardrobe, which would be till about half past eight. Then you probably get some breakfast. Hopefully get some breakfast mm -hmm. and then you'll do from say 9 a.m. until 1 Probably filming straight and then get 1 till 2 you can get lunch and if you started the day at 6 a.m. You'll probably finish at about 8 p.m. Wow or something and if you're Leading it if you're in the if you're on a lead role and you're doing most of the scenes in the film then that's every single day for 30 days up and you know, mm -hmm. it could be six months if it's if it's a Marvel thing, which I've never done anything like that. But if it's right. a big, like, you know, CGI movie mm -hmm. and they've got a huge budget, then you're going to be working on that for months on end sort of thing. But usually on the more indie level, um, it's about 30 days or something. Right. But it does get extremely tiring. And I guess to include as well, you know, once you're on set, it's not just a case of like doing the scenes. It's kind of... The second you finish doing the scenes, you've got hair and makeup running over, you've got the costume department, everybody's just pulling at you, fiddling with you, twisting, touching, kind of changing mm -hmm. everything. The director's telling you what's going to happen in this scene that you're going to do slightly while you're getting pulled and pushed all over the place. And then the second that you're done having that fixed, they're ready to go again. So you get back on set, do it again. The, the day just kind of goes mm -hmm. on like that. You're const kind of just constantly needed which is right. honestly the way that I love to do it. And I always think that if you're in that position, then you're very lucky, you know, because you're needed all the time. Right. And, you know, right. of, often on set, there's, you know, I always see like, there's always, I always talk to the extras and, uh, right. you know, there's a lot of people there that are being an extra because they want to get into acting somehow. And I know how it used to feel when I was first starting out and there'd always be somebody in the lead role or even in one of the supporting roles and I'd be in something smaller and just like wishing that, I was at that point. So I think once you get there, even though it's so much more tiring, if you've got your wits about you, then you know, mm -hmm. you know that you're like in the lucky spot and you should like buck up and just get on with it. <laughs> Do you no, speak to the extras to pass, to try and pass something down or to kind of give them a bit of applied knowledge or like you oh, say, no. No? no, I think. <laughs> 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 no, I'd say yeah, just there to pass your time. Yeah, no, I'm it's bored. Out, What's happening? <laughs> out, of, out of humanity, and just like I don't know. Yeah. I often think that there's a bit of a divided line on sets mm. between extras and actors, and quite often you'll get runners and people who work for the production saying, "Can you not disturb the actors? Don't approach the actors." Yeah, so, I know. And so mm -hmm. I prefer to approach them myself, just to go and hang out, or just be like, hey, "Look, mm. it's not like that. We're cool. You know, whatever." Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks for being here. You're yeah. appreciated, you know, or just because it's, it bugs me as well. You know, like as an actor, you get your, if it starts raining, someone will run over with an umbrella and I know they're just trying to protect the mm -hmm. makeup and the hair and the costume mm -hmm. more than anything. They don't want to have to redo the work, but it feels when yeah. you're sat with like loads of extras who aren't getting looked after or a blanket wrapped around them or a hot water bottle. You know, that kind of bothers me to be in this position where you're getting kind of looked after on a, a better level. But I guess it's because you're working the longest hours and because, mm -hmm. you know, you're needed to be in good nick. And if you get sick, they're screwed, you know. Mm -hmm. so right. I get right. it. But I always just like to, I like to, I don't know, create that little bond of humanity between people who are working on a set and make sure everybody feels equal. 
in some way. No, that's 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 really nice, Josh. Because like I, I mean, of course, I'm a big fan of the of the show extras anyway, and it is quite quite yeah, brilliantly de- quite brilliantly depicts what it's what it's like. You know, like oh, mate, it's please shockingly give me. accurate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's right. And 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 I myself have been through situations when I'm doing a music video. I just did. I shot one in India, and India is a whole other level because in India, of course, there's so many people. They're trying to employ as many people as they can. So a set just for a music video can be 150 people just mm-hmm. for a music video. I had personally around me 12 people. <clears throat> To you know, one would just his job was to hold my water all day. They had another guy to hold my diet coke all day, and I was like, "Hey, man, can one guy just hold both bottles?" Like, <laughs> I feel bad that this dude's running, and he's like, "Diet coke, time? no, okay, water, yeah, fine, this guy." And I was like, "What?" So, but they were appreciative of the fact that they had a job, and mm-hmm. when I started looking at it like that, and not like, "Oh, I feel bad," like. You know, then I understood that they love that. He goes, gets to go home and goes, yo, I was on set of a music video today. It was sick. All I had to do was hold water all day. And he, <laughs> and, and, he, and he probably enjoyed it, but made it more fun when we do talk to them and we have fun with them and stuff like that. Um, so one thing I was thinking about the other day, um, lines. Okay. Mm. Let's say you p- and murdered a scene. You executed it, killed it, emotional. And then you, are there times where you do forget something happened in your brain, a brain fart, and you forget the next line. You're like, oh, I just fucked this whole thing up for everyone. <laughs> Has that happened much or are you just a pro and just always nail it? Um, it's happened, but I've, I tend to be complete freak about it and over obsessed before I get to set. Um, mm. I actually, what I quite like to do uh, if I have a leading role in something or if it's film and it's, you know, like a TV show, I wouldn't do this for because it's so much dialogue and so much kind of other people. And But if it's a leading role in a film, then I like to make an audio book of the whole film. And I'll, oh, wow. So I'll do the basically like if you imagine a table read where someone's doing the narration, then you've got each of the actors doing all the parts for all the different actors. But I'll kind of read through everything myself and kind of play all the different characters on different channels and then pan them into different ears and then kind of put sound effects and put music. Oh, on you're geeky. Then. Yeah. You're a super yeah. geek about it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Carry on, carry on. You're doing sound effects. Yeah. Go on. What after sound, the sound effects? Sound effects, put the music in and then like, uh, put the music in. If there's music in the script, put it He's in. He's doing the whole film. He's doing the whole film. The whole film. <laughs> and if a car pulls so up, I, I find a sound effect of a car pulling up. Come and I'll put on. It in. You can even put it going from the right can through into the left one. It's it's like, whoa, he just went past. There he was. I felt it. Wow. And then what you can do is delete the sound effects. And once you finish the film, I listen to that for like two weeks on repeat in the gym, just kind of like running or whatever. And then you can kind of delete the sound effects, delete the music, and then delete every scene I'm not in and then strip it down to that. And then you can delete your character and sit and do the read through of all just your scenes with the other characters. You can even get rid of the narration, keep just like trimming it down and down and down until all you've got is dialogue and your scenes, but you know the whole film inside out. That's amazing. Yeah, and then by the time you get to set, you can like kind of say everybody else's lines as well. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. So you know all the lines. (laughs) A lot of the time, if if I go in like that, there's only a couple of projects that I've done it for. I did it for Northern Soul, which was my first film ever, which was like a very special experience to me and the first time I ever even tried acting. I did it for Modern Life is Rubbish. It's actually up online. I put it on SoundCloud if you want to hear what I did. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, we definitely need to get that link. We definitely need to get that link. Yeah, Modern Life is Rubbish, Josh Whitehouse, SoundCloud. I put it up. Um, And I did it for Valley Girl as well, but I don't think I've released that one yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and I did it for The Happy Worker, which was one of my favorite projects ever. Yeah. Um, Where can we watch so Happy yeah, Worker? Is that? It's not out yet. We, okay. um, we finished it like uh, in end of 2018. Um, okay. And it's just been in an editing process and it's all a bit of a mystery right now. But that one's it's um, okay. executive produced by David Lynch. Uh, wow. It's oh, wow. a very, very crazy story, crazy film unusual concept it's about a bunch of guys digging a giant hole in the desert and you don't really know why they're doing it and neither do they but they don't mind they're just really happy it's called the happy worker wow yeah one of my favorite it's kind of like a utopian kind of Uh 
dystopian. I never know which one it is. Really? Utopian yeah, or dystopian. One of the other. No, one of the other. A bit of both. <laughs> Josh, Josh, how did you? Is it because of your musical background? I mean, that sounds like a. I mean, a hell of a project. I mean, as an editor, putting that yeah. together, that audio book. I mean, I I do sometimes scratch when I'm I'm like blocking out an advert or blocking out a film. That's mm-hmm. a lot of work, buddy. I mean, like. Where yeah. did the inspiration to do that come from? Was it just because, like, you know, you, you had this big first job, and you're like, I'm going to fucking nail this. Like, where does that come from? It comes from, yeah, partly from music in that when I started acting, I didn't have anybody to work with. I didn't have any actor friends to talk to, and I didn't really have people to rehearse with, more to the point. And so I started doing this thing for auditions. When I got auditions in, I would record the audition scene. And then I'd delete myself and I would press play and rehearse acting the scene with myself. Mm. And so then once I'd done a bunch of auditions like that, then I actually scored a lead role in something. And then I was like, huh, like maybe right. I could do this, but for the whole film. And so yeah. then, and it also, it made it more fun for me because yeah. then I could, um, I could like start putting music in it and stuff. And I found that if, I also started doing this thing where if I had a monologue, then I would, in, to make it fun, I don't like reading that much. And so to make it fun, I'd just be like, all right, what's the vibe of this scene? It's like a bit dark. So I'd pick like a minor chord and then put like a little hip hop beat in and then just like start rapping the monologue over the top of this beat. And so every time I was learning some big long monologue, I'd make a little song out of it. And so that started uh. becoming, like just the using fun of using like Ableton and sounds and sound design kind of makes learning a lot more fun for me than actually just sitting and reading a script again and again and again and again. And so it becomes like, it take me about three days to record all of the dialogue of the entire script. And then I'd spend about two weeks adding sound effects and music, but it was actually during the sound effects and music that I would learn the script because I'm just going over every scene, thinking about every noise that should happen what songs are there and sounds and through doing that by the end of it i would kind of get to um i just i'd know it like just accidentally so, know it so you got a director the next thing you go don't worry about the score i've handled it i've got this <laughs> got the score i've got the soundtrack it's fine it's all good dude you know what yeah. that this is actually a gem you know like this is why i love these podcasts is because i get to know about things like that now what you've just told me i've been in the industry for uh, adam we've been all been around it todd you record people for a living that's what you've been doing this is really something so fascinating to me because there's so many people would never understand how do they do that i was watching a, a show the other day and the monologue was so long and i was like how the fuck did he how and I want to know the techniques. Mm. I'm so, I'm obsessed with people's mm-hmm. techniques. And yeah. dude, that to me is, you nailed something. You just said you made it fun. Yeah. It was fun for you. It wasn't a mm-hmm. chore like, oh, I've got to learn lines. Yeah. Finding a way to make it fun. Um, and you know, and another good one is to just write it out line by line, line by line, by line, by line, mm. and then have a piece of paper and you're guessing which one is next. But a mixture of the two, if one's really tricky to go in, I might bring out that technique as well. Um, but definitely kind of just making a, a way to make it fun. And I remember when I first started doing acting and the idea of learning a monologue was crazy to me because I could remember lines of poetry or rhymes or raps, mm-hmm. and things like that. But I was like, this doesn't rhyme. Like, how are you supposed to remember the next word? <laughs> right. And, you know, like, after doing it for, like, in different, so many experiments trying to figure out how to learn this stuff, it just, you know, there's a part of your brain that just eventually goes... No, you can mm-hmm. remember that stuff too. And it's just like yeah. connections with the next sentence or the one before it so that everything you say always reminds you of the next sentence. That's so, it. And that yeah. in itself becomes satisfying. And I think with all of this stuff or with any kind of work, if this wasn't the work I was doing, I'd be trying to find a way to make it fun so that, you right. can, so that life's bearable. You know? Will Smith, uh, actually, I saw this interview with Will Smith where he said, obviously, he came from like you, you know, because I know you have a, a same musical background too. You know, obviously he came from rapping when he had to suddenly learn lines. He was like, well, this is totally different because, you know, I can learn a rap, but that's because I've already been doing it behind the mic and then like 
you know, it kind of becomes mm. like a nature. So similarly, he was like, well, let me apply that same strategy. So he did what you said and he ended up memorizing everybody's lines so that when they had finished their bit, he knew it was his turn, except yeah. he said what he fucked up in, in Fresh Prince, which is brilliant, is that he didn't realize that as they were reading their lines, so Uncle Phil's talking, he's Lip syncing oh. Uncle Phil stuff. <laughs> His lip syncing Uncle Phil stuff before he exactly. <laughs> yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> so so they're like, no, what are you, Will? What are you doing? He's like, oh shit, I didn't realize. <laughs> right. By your and, and I, That's funny. Yeah, and I thought that was so cool. So let's talk about your music, man. Uh, first of all, mm. uh, we know we we have a common connect, by the way. So Reeks. Yeah, Reeks. Yeah, and Reeks. Zany. And Zany, man, they're my boys. So obviously for the people who are listening, um, you know, you guys know I've been obsessed with beatboxing ever since I started music. And Reeps and and uh, MC Zany have been with me, you know, especially Zany the whole time, literally for like 14, 15 years we've been touring yeah. together. But you actually used to live with Reeps, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, until very recently, actually. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I was about... Let me think. When I was about 18 to 22, I was starting to do London. I just looked into London and I was doing the film until I was 20. And then around sort of 22, I was on the music scene doing like the UK festivals a lot. Uh, and I remember I met Reaps at about six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday in a forest. And uh, really? I was just sitting on the ground with my guitar. My brother had his drum and we were just jamming away. And Reaps just kind of like, comes over out of nowhere in the pitch black he just kind of comes over and he's like i want to show you something i was like what and he just starts going bow, 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 in my ear i was like wow this is dope what? yeah cool and then we ended up yeah, sitting there for like, yeah we sat there for a couple of hours and we were jamming to some people and stuff and then it turned out that he lived in walthamstow which was like a mile away from where i was living and so then he ended up coming to visit us afterwards and then we just became really good friends and about a I don't know, six months later or a year later, he ended up moving into our place. Cause we actually, we built this warehouse uh, and we call it the hub. I don't know if you know about this place, but we built a warehouse. My brother, my eldest brother kind of quit his job as a teacher to manage my band. And then he found this empty warehouse and we built it into bedrooms with the idea of creating like a live work space to try and attract musicians, creatives and people to kind of connect with each other and help each other sort of promote each other's projects and things like that. Uh, and so that is up this, sick. Yeah, it was dope, man. It was like 10 years of my life. I've been, I've been living there and all my stuff still wow. at the moment. I've been in LA for a year and, you know, we had Reeps move in with us, Ballsy moved in with us for a while. We've got Hobbit living next door, but he's moved out now. And, you know, like the beatbox, Pete. beatbox, yeah, beatbox, like so many of the beatbox yeah, collective Pete kind Box. of came through, um, came through the hub and the hub works. So we ended up building two warehouses next to each other. Uh, we had Pavan from Foreign Beggars come with us for a while. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's been a crazy road, man. We met a lot of people through that place, Lazy Habits. Uh, Troll 23, like a big list of people really that have been uh, very solid. Man, that is mad. Home. That sounds like jokes. So you guys just live there. It wasn't like you just worked there. That was your home. Yeah, we lived there and built like <laughs> bedrooms, amazing. kitchen, shower. We had a stage, a DJ booth. Uh, what? We host... <laughs> yeah. That is sick. That yeah, sounds put a like net across the ceiling so you could like hang in the net above the house or whatever. Oh, wow. Crazy. It was dope. That's so it was sick. Dope. And it was kind of through having that place uh, in sort of Waltham area, Tottenham Hill, that we uh, <clears throat> we ended up meeting uh, Reaps at festivals, and then he came moved in with us. And then through Reaps, we met the whole Beatbox Collective, and they all started coming over for parties and stuff. Um, so, yeah, wow. that's kind of how I ended up meeting everybody. Uh, it was some of the best years of my life living in that place. Yeah, and they're they're really really amazing guys. I mean, Zany, you know, like I said, have been touring for so many years together. Um, music, you know, it's one of those things. Like uh, I, I, was, I always say to people, you know, because people know that I'm a musician, but then like you want to do different things, you want to dabble in other stuff, and you know, you might like acting. And then people always have an issue with that. Sometimes they're like, oh, but you're a mus what well, do you suddenly think you can act? And I'm like. You know, a lot of the time, just being a creative person, you kind of end up doing a bit of everything. Musicians were never actors, but then all of a sudden they introduced a music video and they're like, yeah, just, just to act it out. And you're like, well, what do you mean? I'm not an actor, mm -hmm. I'm a musician. 
No, mm -hmm. then he's, so now you're suddenly acting. You're acting the role mm -hmm. of the person you wrote the song about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you are learning to act. And then similarly, there's a lot of people who are actors who just, because they're creatives and they love, they love music. They love music. Music's part of their life and they probably tend to pick it up quickly. What came first for you? What was your first love? Or was it simultaneous? What was, explain, because you do a bit of everything. Oh, um, I mean, when I was very young, I always thought I was going to be a painter because my mum's a painter, uh, Penny Whitehead. Right. She's excellent. And she wow. kind of taught me to do all of that when I was very young. And so I always thought I was going to do that. But then I got a bit older and my sister friend was in a band and I kind of started feeling music. And then I, around 12, started playing the guitar. And music was definitely what I was going to do uh, up until I was about 18 when I moved to London. And my brother was getting his gigs and um, he got us a gig for Jack Wills. Do you know Jack Wills? Mm -hmm. It's like a clothing brand, and they were doing a yeah, yeah, the varsity it. polo match. Um, right. And so there was like bands playing in little tents everywhere. It was kind of like a festival. We were playing at this thing, and this lady comes up to me with a clipboard afterwards and asked me if I'd be up for like casting for the, um, the modeling campaign that they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I go to this audition, um, and like the models outside are like, oh, apparently it's a really big photographer. And the, um, they've got like a guy in there from Dead Man's Shoes, you know, the Shane Meadows film, which was one of my favorite films. It's a wicked film, very dark, but very cool. Um, Paul Sado was kind of like the coach for the modeling shoot, which was like an unusual thing. Cause I'd done bits of modeling in life before okay. here and there, but I didn't really like it very much. I found it all very like rigid. But right. I thought, hey, if I can get the work, then I'll take it, you know? Right. Um, but I do this audition and it's all kind of, it's just so different. It's very like improvised based and they're like, all right, I'm going to throw this tennis ball in the air. I want you to clap as many times as you can and then catch it. And then I want you to kiss this girl, fight that guy. And I want you to dance like nobody's looking. I want you to scream oh. at the camera as loud as you can. <laughs> all right. And so I was like, okay. I just kind of like <laughs> got into it. Um, and I ended up getting the job with a couple of other guys. Um, it was like four guys and four girls and we we're all supposed to just be like making out all the time basically and, and dancing and having fun and pie fights and things like that in the countryside. As you do. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> Never uh, met before. Yeah, I was like 18 years old, like this is kind of cool. Um, and so I ended up doing this. I did two campaigns with um, the photographer, Elaine Constantine. She's an um, amazing photographer. Um, and we just kind of like hit it off really well. And by the end of the second shoot she said have you ever done acting before do you want to come and learn to dance because i'm working on this film that i've been trying to get off the ground for 15 years and uh, it's called northern soul you ever heard of northern soul music i was like no i haven't uh and so she's like come and learn to dance if you want and then you might be able to be an extra in the movie extra um, <laughs> an extra yeah i was i was going for an extra part uh and i kind of went along to these dance classes and i started going every month um, and then I spent the next year going every month, sometimes every week. Uh, and I had, I, at this point, like, I just really wanted to work with her again, um, wow. whatever it took, because I liked her so much. And I liked the team. I liked Paul. I liked everything about it. But dancing to me was kind of terrifying. Um, right. Yeah, I and, hate I'm shit at that. Yeah, I was just like, oh, I don't know, like learning to oh, dance in front of people is kind of scary. Yeah, I can't do it. And these guys are all really good. They're doing backflips and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I started getting really into it. And uh, at this point, I, I had no money. I was kind of borrowing bus fare to get home. My brother was my landlord, so he was letting me not pay rent. And I was able to just kind of dedicate all of my money and time to go into these dance classes and hoping that something might come out of it. Um, and then after about a year of doing it, she says, do you want to try acting? I was like, yeah, sure. So she gives me the script and then we start practicing scenes in her kitchen. Then she starts like sending me to meet uh, acting coaches that are doing her a favor and let me like help out Claire Garvey who's in the film with me she was helping me out a bit as well and then I started like going off to Manchester and meeting DJs from the scene and like interviewing people and like finding out what it'd be like to be a, a DJ back in the 70s or or whatever um, and then literally I did this for like two years and still like living off pittance and eating potatoes for dinner um, and just like dancing all the time and then I had about. Why were you dancing? I don't understand because, why you were dancing this whole time. Oh, because the movie's about dancing. Yeah. Oh, so we're still on that same movie. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, same yeah. movie. So she, same now movie. she's think. Okay, so now I spent two years with her <laughs> prepping for it after I met those guys. Um, so first you were just meant to be a dancer. Now she's like, do you want to act 
acting role within the same movie. Do you want to try acting? And gotcha. I'll consider you for the same movie. Ah, with a got role. you, got you. Because okay. originally it was just for an extra, but then she gave me gotcha. this opportunity to try and be an actor for it. Okay. Um, and so then, yeah, basically, after about two years of all this prep, we did a quick camera test uh, to try and like prove it to the producers that she thought that I could do it. Um, and it was this intense, crazy feeling, like suddenly, like trying to act on camera. I had no mm -hmm. idea if I was any good. I had no specific training, but wow. somehow managed to play this character who's just like bastard. No, I've now come on, then go on, yeah, yeah lad, let's have some. Yeah. You got any pills, mate? All that yeah. stuff. <laughs> That's yeah, good. Well. You're hired. Yeah, you're hired. <laughs> I would, I would have hired you just off yeah, that, mate. That's exactly. Pretty, pretty fucking good. <laughs> fucking bastard. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, so I ended up. Um, Ended up booking it, and then I played the lead role in this movie. It was honestly one of the coolest and best memories of making a film I've ever had. Um, and that ended up getting me agents. That ended up getting wow. a lot of attention in the papers because people started booking out cinemas just to watch it because the production company that released it only put it in like three cinemas for four days, but it ended up being in the oh. cinema for two months just on people's demand. Mm -hmm. um, which got it quite a stir, and that ended up making me get agents and move on to doing acting after that, sort of. Got you. Ever since, yeah. And then got I was you. like, well, oh, this is crazy. Uh, so I feel like yeah. I don't really get this opportunity. I'm going to throw mm. everything at it. Everything into yeah. this for yeah, a bit yeah. and see what happens. Yeah. How do you feel about, because um, this is how many years ago now, that first break? That was about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, right perfect mm -hmm. amount of time has passed from 10 years to now obviously uh the way that people are discovered is completely different right people are like the years this is the the, the time of the influencers now mm -hmm. they are crushing everything they're getting all the big contracts they're getting all the big stuff it's really the yeah. time of the influencers and that mm -hmm. didn't exist when we you know like 10 years ago it really wasn't that so mm -hmm. You did a cheeky smirk there. What was that about? <laughs> well, you know, I just, it's funny. I've been joking with my girlfriend about this, about how it's like, you know, like your parents, everybody, everybody's parents always used to just be like, oh, it was better in my day. And you're always like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm getting We're older there. now. Yeah. And I'm still there. there. Yeah, then. It is, it yeah. is better in our day. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> All this TikTok stuff's kind of nonsense. Whatever happened to, you know, and I'm starting Good to do it. Hard work and graft. <laughs> yeah, hard work and graft. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing wrong with with talking about it because that's exactly what this is. Yeah. It's about it's about that, right? Because we've come up through a different avenue now. The reason I like talking about this stuff is there's a lot of people who are like, they see that, I go, I want that. How do they get that? Oh, I do this, I guess, right? I make TikTok videos. I do this. Yeah, Whereas so you went through the a completely different system, you know, getting an I mean, agent. I also get got it. really lucky. That that whole yeah. thing for me was like once in a million kind of a situation. Like it's very rare to. But do also, a you you lead applied in a movie without. But you being... applied a lot of dedication in there, buddy. Like as in, oh, like, tons. Yeah, that is a lot. Yeah. yeah, I mean, tons. But even the opportunity to apply that much right, dedication right, doesn't right. come around once in a while because there's so many people that are ready to give that level of dedication. But it's just like, oh, you just happen to meet a director, and they just happen mm. to be looking for that role, and just happen mm. to have the opportunity and the time to train you to act when you didn't have any experience in the first place. You know, mm. kind of. Yeah. Uh, so I know I got super lucky just with the people that surrounded me at that particular time, and that matched with my kind of desire to get everything done as best as I could, I guess, you know. What, 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 what riles you, what, what gets you going now, bro? What is it? What, what, what do you love? What gets you like fucking passionate? What are you so passionate about? Um, I mean, the, the beautiful thing is that acting's kind of been something I'm really passionate about, but has become kind of my work. And, That's what I'm, um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, I can, take money I earn from my acting to buy myself a nice microphone or some recording mm -hmm. equipment and I can just make a music man being able so to like uh, music. put ideas down and create songs and put it out and you know there was just a time I always dreamt of having the ability to do that kind of as and when I feel like it and to be able to have wow. equipment and just create is uh a dope thing I just kind of, I kind of I don't I only really do it for me you know and then if people like mm -hmm. it then cool but um 
maybe one day I can get back into being like more full time on music and stuff. But for the moment, I think I love I love working as an actor, uh, and it gets me just as riled up in a completely different way. But the difference right. is that music is entirely mine, whereas acting you are helping create someone else's vision unless you're the director mm. and the star which is also very unusual there's yeah. a don't take this the wrong way but I, I really have to get your opinion on this a lot of people uh when you're an actor your 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 job you get paid to fool people to trick people into believing that you are this other person mm. it's a really incredible talent to really convince everyone no i am this person like, well, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe you are that person and then you see them in real life and you're like <laughs> you're nothing like the guy that you of course i'm not like the fucking guy i played <laughs> who's a villain who lives in space like of course i'm not like that guy so yeah. a lot of people find it i find it really incredible how when you do meet an actor in real life you're like, oh, wow, like you could be a super, super funny, really funny actor when you're, when you're acting. But in real life, you're like, that's just not who you are. You don't crack jokes. You're not funny by that. Game. You can pull off a great joke, right, Adam? Or, you know, how many times have we met people like that? We're yeah. like, oh, we yeah. were You had the expectation. Really... Was that that guy in, what was that TV show that you put me onto with you? Oh, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, literally yeah. in, in the show, you have a very the particular mindset of him and then Jay was like yeah look at his Instagram and it was he's very active he's he's uh, vegan mm -hmm. he's this and it's just like mm -hmm. and again it, not to be like oh my god it's so surprising that the actor yeah. is not like the person he portrays but yeah it's yeah there's, something there's some yeah I'm so I'm going somewhere with this so yeah. so the fact the fact that you are so able to do that um when you are yourself and you're just Josh and you're with your mm -hmm. mates and you know you like to do music and you know this is what you do in your in your spare time um do you ever feel like there's something an avenue where you're not able to fully connect with a fan base because you're so used to playing different people do you ever feel like your fans never get a chance to know who you are and does that even matter to you uh i mean it's uh... I don't know. I had the, in terms of fans and stuff, I think I probably had the biggest influx of fans from the night before Christmas because it was mm -hmm. literally worldwide like this mm -hmm. all of a sudden and it was 90,000 followers just popped up from nowhere mm -hmm. uh, in about two days, which was kind of crazy. And I mean, I guess I make an effort to always just, if we're talking about posting and stuff, I try to just be myself and stick by my guns and not kind of try to play into a specific crowd. But, you know, that generally mm -hmm. means that I'll post something and everybody goes, oh, wait, he's not really a knight. And then they just, right. yeah. <laughs> they post exactly. something. just like 400 people disappear for every post. But yeah, it's okay, yeah. like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he doesn't yeah, exactly. talk like that all the time. Yeah, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my dear yeah. lady, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if I was posting that stuff all the time, then yeah, sure, I'd it. be really happy. But I was, yeah. I was just like, no, I do music and I, I draw pictures and whatever. Right. It, it kind of puts you off Instagram a little bit because it was kind of more fun when it was just me and my mates on there. You know, yeah. and right. really like as you go into acting, kind of things have gone up or music. Because I have noticed profile. that. I've really yeah. noticed that. I've noticed that sometimes actors, are, they're so much more famous than singers because you, why are you famous? Because people are used to seeing your face. That's your, it's your face that they're used to seeing. With singers, mm -hmm. it's our voice that they're used to hearing. Mm -hmm. Now you can have a song that you hear and it's your favorite song and you might have no idea what the person singing it looks like. Mm -hmm. That's happened so many times. I've heard songs on radio. I love, I love this song. I have no idea what he looks like. Don't even know right. the guy's name if he's in a band. It's that mm -hmm. insane. It's an odd thing, yeah. It's an odd thing, whereas everybody knows your face, but they mm -hmm. might not get to know who you are as a human being. And I've noticed that when I look at their Instagram pages and I see that, I'm like, wow, you kind of live a very kind of protected, sheltered life in some sense, in that like the real you gets to get protected. Mm -hmm. And the other, the, you just get to play roles to, so mm -hmm. nobody actually can kind of really penetrate you or judge you for who you are as a human being. Do you yeah. like that part about, about being an actor? Do you like that slight anonymity? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's funny because I like to be wacky and silly and everything mm. like that. But kind of, I've always thought that the, the more famous you become, 
like I generally if there's like an actor that I know is like super famous I don't know like Ethan Hawke or like there's a, there's a ton of actors that are like this but that you just you don't really know what they're doing right now they always mm. do a good job they're always like a great performance reliable mm. loads of films Joseph Gordon-Levitt's another one but it's it's kind of mm. like I don't really know what they're up to right now and that's a nice yeah. thing I think because they're not mm. you know dying for the spotlight all the time mm. which is kind mm. of how it starts to come off if you're constantly like looking for more which is what a lot of today's generation is in a sense mm. you know and so it's kind of a funny thing because I like to be quite silly and because before I'd always just find it silly to I don't know, do a little stupid dance on my Instagram mm. or something and be like yeah. well, I don't care right <laughs> yeah as I've gained more followers and things like uh-huh. that, kind of it puts me off a little bit because then I'm kind of just like, well, mm. I'll just like I'm gonna back off a little bit because mm. yeah, I do kind of like that anonymity a little bit, uh, and it's only something that's dawning on me recently, really, as I've been more in this position. Uh, Isn't that interesting? And that's what I like to talk about because you know a lot of the kids who see us aspire to just be that get there famous. quickly yeah. get there quickly what do you want to be uh, famous for what yeah. just famous oh no so, right i've never i've never wanted to be famous i just mm-hmm. in order to do anything that i want to be able to do you need to have some like you can't if you're going to be an artist you can't sell a painting unless people know about your paintings and unless they've seen your work and if you're going to sell songs you're not going to be able exactly. to make any money unless people are your fans Acting, right. it's a little different, and it kind of jumps ahead, and you, you know, you'll get a job if you're a good actor, you know, or if you've got a good agent, and you don't necessarily need fans to keep working. Although it all goes hand in hand. Anything art based, it's all about having an audience. Uh, an audience, yeah. Otherwise, what are you doing it for? Who are you doing it for? Nobody. So you're not going to get anywhere, you know. And right. so it's kind of just this weird thing of like, I've never wanted to be like a famous guy I don't really like the idea of going to a restaurant and being interrupted while I'm like hanging out mm. with people or that big, or feeling like you can't go anywhere and I remember when I nearly booked um well I did book but the Game of Thrones the Game of Thrones season that was going to happen uh Crazy. you know there was that was like a huge deal and there was like my mind was like just buzzing because I was just kind of like whoa I've just booked that that's like mm-hmm. I know what happens if you're in that you know like, like my <laughs> life's about to change yeah you ain't <laughs> yeah. walking down the street you know? anymore exactly and that's like and I was like being like well I, I guess I'll enjoy these two years you know before, mm-hmm. of anonymity and then that. everything yeah. goes away yeah because yeah, that's a, a privilege really in a way and to an extent you know like constantly being judged or being watched or you know who you're with and this and that and what, what you're, you're wearing doing, yeah. what you're wearing or something, or something. it's just kind of like I don't want that but like I want to be able to be in big successful productions and I want to be able to act the rest of my life and I want to be able to continue to be creative you know so I think there's a firm balance and a, fir- a, a fine line to draw as to how you handle that. And I think... It how accessible you are. And a lot of people are growing up just wanting to be famous these days. But honestly, like, I don't think... I think the real... Uh, I want to be careful how I say this, but... No, it's extent, okay. Like, yeah. A real artist doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily want fame, but gets famous because they're creating. And they because of the what art. They do. Yeah. And exactly. then a lot of people get a little envious of that fame and would like to... And it seems from the outside, like, oh, I want to get the free clothes. I want to be rich. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And that all comes with being famous. I want to be Mm -hmm. famous. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of people get this mentality about doing anything they can just to be famous. Whereas the people who were originally getting famous in the first place don't necessarily like that or want it. It's just like an offshoot of what they're trying to do to survive. You know? Amazing. Couldn't have put it better. That's, the, that's exactly what I say. Like, I never wanted fame. I just enjoyed singing. What comes with singing? Oh, you've done a great song. Cool. Go and perform it. Okay, cool. Then you perform it. Oh, I love you. Oh, thank you. Uh, can I have your autograph? I guess so. Uh, <laughs> can I have a picture with you? All right. I don't know why, but okay. Right. And, and mm-hmm. that's it. Before you know it, you're famous. And you're like, well, I didn't do it for that. I did it because I love singing and I love the art and everything you just said. Um, <clears throat> when you're, I feel like, like, you as an, as an actor say now, and you do all of it, like the acting, modeling, and the, the singing. Um, when you're watching a movie, um, can you just watch it as a normal person or are you critiquing like, oh, what a fuck, terrible actor, I wouldn't have picked him. Like, <laughs> do you ever, can you just switch off sometimes or do you find yourself critiquing things? I don't tend to critique. I think generally, I mean, unless something is like 
Awful. you know, glaringly bad. Right, uh, right. And I'm like, oh, I did, that's a bit funny. How did they get that? Um, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but generally, you know, I think people are, are in things because they've done a good job in their auditions. So I'm kind of watching, like, getting inspiration, right. if anything. Uh, well, that's what uh, I was going to say as well, yeah. Are there times mm-hmm. where you watch and you go, holy crap, that is a next level of acting. Like, this person is a master at this shit. Absolutely, yeah, all the time. All the time in a lot of cinema at the moment there's a lot of really amazing actors out there uh and i draw a blank and i don't i don't like to list them because like there's always another one that is equally as good or mm. better so just there's but there's tons of amazing performances Let, out there let's the talk moment. about accents sorry you just made me think because obviously you're a brit in la now and i'm sure you do a tons mm-hmm. of auditions are, are a lot of auditions asking you um to stick with the british accent or do they want you to do an american accent can you talk me through that uh, a lot of American, yeah. Really? So I have been... I, I mean, the, the minute I got an agent in Los Angeles, um, I signed with CAA in mm-hmm. 2020. No, 2010, mm-hmm. sorry, obviously. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I got a, a Los Angeles agent and I was suddenly just like, I should probably start learning an American accent because I, I feel like I can do one, but I don't think I can. <laughs> you know? No. Uh, yeah, so, so um, go on then. I, I've got to hear. Mine is so shit. We've talked about this in different podcasts. I'm yeah. terrible. I can only do two extremes. There's the, the rapper and then there's the California guy who's like, wait, like, you know, he's right. like, Yo, what's up? Right, How's right. it going, man? Yeah, what's dude. Up? Like, cool, dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can never do a generic, <laughs> yeah. I'm from freaking, I don't know, Seattle. I can't do right. that guy. Uh, Can you do I mean, that guy? You no. need a dialogue. Do I've, a dialogue. I, I've, <laughs> let me think. So I've been trying to learn just doing something straight, just a normal accent, without without being too heavily this direction or that direction, not going into like, I don't know, like a surfer dude or something, which you can do, but like, it, it's, you don't want to do that if you're being an actor. You kind of need to find this like midway that accent. That was pretty is, damn convincing. Todd, what do we think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, was, in the room there we go <laughs> that was yeah. pretty on point yeah yeah i mean, I mean like I you been, see some I've been really focusing on it for years now <laughs> the, oh you see you did the r you did the r i can't get that r for yeah. year years. years i can't do this yeah i've been focusing on it for years. years and years dude. yeah years actually I have, a, I have a question i really want to ask and uh um it, it all comes from uh you know valley girl was this iconic movie and you know nicholas cage is this kind of lauded uh, you know, it was one of his like kevin smith we uh, had a big controversy about uh, them even remaking the film in the first place to step into that role did you did you watch the original or did you not want to, to color your performance in any way or when you're making something or you're stepping into a role that's become in some ways iconic What's the danger in that? Um, I mean, yeah. When I first heard about this and then I was like, oh, shoot, Nicolas Cage did it? <laughs> you know, it's, it's got a big fan base, that film, and people really loved him in it. And so I kind of knew that I was going to get some stick for doing it, and it was a classic, and people don't really like things getting remade. But I kind of convinced mm. myself that it was okay because we were making a musical out of it. Yeah. You know, and it was something completely different from the original. And also, I mean, like, even for that, like, that was my first time truly being an American in an American production, being the only Brit on a set full Mm. of Americans pretending to be American was a Mm. terrifying feeling, really, to to try and get over and get my head through and then, like, not being fully sure if I just sound terrible. Right. Um, And I I did for that. (laughs) Nah. No, I would, I'd, I'd do it whenever we were doing the film. I, I, cause the thing was, if I stayed in character and I kept doing an American accent, I felt as though it would feel as though I was making fun of people that I was around. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When that's people so are talking funny. to me, I'm like, yeah, dude, whatever. whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally. I'm right. not yeah. mocking you. <laughs> I'm not mocking you. I'm just trying to practice. This it, is my but, process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and even for that movie, I kind of, I did do kind of like, I don't know, a bit of a bro kind of. Um, mm. California typical accent but I you know since that movie uh, then I've been trying to really hone in on learning something more kind of very standardized or looking at midwest accents and things like that uh and it's it's difficult it's difficult not to do caricatures but yeah um, dude 
I, yeah. I mean, I've seen there's there's some. I'm not shitting on anyone because they're all amazing. I do love love all of the actors like that I'm about to talk about. Like you know, you see your Clive Owens or you see your you Hugh Grants. They're just best when they do the British. And there's certain people who pick it, who who really can nail it. But Hugh Grant, like he probably just goes, I'm not doing it. I'm just, I don't need to. This mm -hmm. is what I do. I will get all these roles all the time. I just don't need to be an American. And I'm not saying he can't because I, I actually had a little fanboy moment with him because of the fact we went to the oh, same yeah. school. We went to the same school. So we went both went to Latimer Upper School in Hammersmith. And uh, I met him and I had this really interesting conversation with him because, you know, again, what we do, it, you know, we, we're painting a certain lifestyle to people who are watching your movies or listening to my songs. And they want to believe that we don't suffer the same bullshit that they do. And we don't feel the same things that they do. We don't go through the same pain, the same heartache. We don't ever feel down, depressed like they do. Right. Because it's mm -hmm. an escape. It's a form of escapism. And I remember talking to Hugh Grant for the first time. And I said, so, uh, you know, what you got coming up? He goes, oh, just another terrible movie where I can play a bumbling idiot. And I went, <laughs> but I like those movies. <laughs> and just in one second, and I was like, wait, so do you not like doing that then? Do you not enjoy mm. those movies? And it was such a moment. And even me being in the entertainment industry, I didn't want to believe that he didn't love being a guy or I wanted to believe that he genuinely enjoys doing that. And yeah. he goes, and, and he said to me, he goes, what, sit in a chair for three hours while I get makeup and get pampered and you know, there's some more serious stuff going on and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow, like he's at that point now where he's like, yeah, I want to focus on other shit that's, that matters more than me being this pampered star mm. in a chair, you mm. know? And, and I feel like, is that the reason why it, is there some are there things that you feel a lot more passionate about other outside of your work that matter to you? I think it kind of all comes down to perspective because of course there is more important things going on in the world. I mean, COVID nineteen has proven this to mm. all creatives, really musicians, people in the industry that we are in. You know, suddenly, oh well, it's really just like when it comes down to the bare bones of what do people need to survive. Music isn't on there, you know? Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, and gigs. Yes. And gig, gigs. Gigs. You're right. Out. Like everyone can, you know, we kind of just get cut without being asked yeah. if we want to get cut, you know? So yeah. naturally there is just, there is big and more important things in the world than, you know, being in a makeup chair or being on a set or doing your work. But at the same time, I think it's also, you know, like, I think it's a matter of perspective in that, you know, there's more important things going on, but then also you being a creative and an entertainer, whether it's music or acting or art or whatever, that's our escapism to, mm. to help our mental health and get us through. Mm. But then at the same time, for the people who are also out there in the world, you know, it's like in the war or whatever, the people come in and play the songs to keep the morale up. It's the same. Yeah stuff you know like people that's making right films people putting on songs things for people we're feeding people with entertainment to keep everybody level and happy is kind May. of the job of our, our people that is yeah. our job it's so funny that you said that because i said that uh, before this i was doing uh, studying to be a doctor and then i said once to a doctor who is very uh, a friend of mine it was his mate he's like the number one in bc child brain surgery and shit whatever he's just like insane and i said to him fucking hell mate i could have been doing that hey just work actually means something and i sort of just said it like that he goes what do you mean he goes if it wasn't for your music we would fucking go mental he goes we need to listen to music to switch off mm -hmm. it's like that's what you provide you know and it was like a, an interesting thing and you just nailed it that's the world needs entertainment they need to escapism todd you look like you want to say something Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah I can. Yeah. You guys are um, enhancing the quality of life. Yeah. Thank you, you know? Todd. That's why I pay you the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thank you. There, there was a meme, wasn't there? There was a meme recently that said, just remember when you know the world went into uh, quarantine, into lockdown, that it was you know, the films and TV series and, and the, the music. Yeah that you guys create that kept us all from kind of like just losing our shit completely. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. There was um, something I kind of wanted to touch on uh, as you were sort of explaining this question or point originally mm. in that when I kind of grew up, me sort of getting involved with 
art, into music, into acting, into anything creative kind of came from, I mean, when I was a kid, I was super socially anxious, like big social phobias, didn't know how to interact with big groups of people. And it would always mm. make me like shut off and I kind of want to hide away or something. Mm. Um, and I found that when my mum had taught me to draw, um, I'd kind of use it as my escape in that I would kind of be in a big group of people and everyone's like, oh, yeah, well, I did this at the weekend and I was going over that place. And what about, what about, what about you? Mm. And I'd just be kind of like, can I even, do I say something now or they're talking? They seem like they're leading this. I don't feel like I can join in. I don't know. Blah, blah. And so uh -huh. I just ended up getting like a sketchbook and sitting in those crowds and I'd sit and draw. And then wow. if somebody came to me, they'd be like, oh, like, I like what you're drawing or whatever. And I'd be like, ah, positive reinforcement. Cool. Thanks. And now we have a conversation because you came yeah. to me. And, da, da, da. and it became this thing where that was my kind of way to deal with my own kind of anxiety or things like that. And then as I've grown up, I realized this, I've been realizing this a lot recently. Uh, but you know, like it became, that just turned into a guitar, which I'd then always have on me at a party mm -hmm. or, and if no one's talking to me or I don't know who I'm talking to, then I'd be just playing my guitar and it's in my little safety net. And then that became being in a band, which became performing, which became, you know, got mm -hmm. me a, a, a gig in acting, which then became, now I'm doing that, you know, it's kind of like always kept mm -hmm. myself entertained. And a lot of my creativity and the reason that I ended up doing this in the first place was always just to it came out of not really knowing how to socialize when I was younger. And obviously now I'm a lot better and I've kind of matured and grown up a lot, but, um, you know, that was, that was me when I was a kid and that led me to being creative in the first place. So a lot of it for me was escapism is was kind of my point. Mate, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, man. Cause Thank that you. really is important. I think there's a lot of kids out there who struggle with that. You know, there's, don't know where they fit in, especially mm. with the cool crowd. It's such a common thing. Not There's only one or two people get to be the cool ones in the crowd, man. They get mm -hmm. to be the center of attention. Everybody else is just a spectator. And some people are okay being a spectator. And other people are like, well, uh, now I, I don't even... I don't even know who I am. Do I fit in with this crowd? Should I even be here? So I appreciate you sharing that, dude, because that's what mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people who are listening who probably feel the same way, you know? Um, yeah. And it's it's a really, that's a nice tool that you just shared there. Yeah, it was a nice tool and it ended up shaping my entire life and I made money out of it eventually. There <laughs> you go. I've lived from it and but, it's yeah. become more than an escape and it's become something that I'm passionate about. And, you know, I have little different avenues that I take creatively but um yeah it was a nice thing that it kind of came from that uh and it got me through a lot of my childhood in a way <laughs> it's amazing i mm. always think that's funny how you said that that became your guitar like it you see that person especially if it's a good looking person with a guitar in the room i'm always like this cunt he's just gonna get all the <laughs> girls all the girls around him oh my god do you play can you play me something let, let oh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's like that scene <laughs> Give me the guitar from yeah. uh, what was the, the, or, the, or, or, or the office as well. Get the guitar, Gareth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But, but right. that's I love that because it's it's really amazing that that you know I can totally see why why Reaps and Zany and all that would be. Is I feel like I've known you for a, a while, man. It's that <laughs> probably the British connection, but it's been a really nice bench. So uh, I appreciate yes. that. Bro. And tell you what. You Tell you what you need to do, Josh. You need to, that's the next business venture. You need to start making, when the, the world starts getting back to normal, you need these, you need Hub LA. You need to start making a creative collective Echo Park, mm. man. I'm already looking out for there you go. a space. Looking out for a space. Don't know how I'm going to find a space, but it's in my mind as something that would be a cool thing to do at some point. Yeah, man. Yeah. So you mentioned, just before you sign off quickly, um, you mentioned that there was um, the... The, it was a movie that you that you worked on the the happy the happy worker yeah what was it called so it's a movie so that's that's hopefully coming out sometime soon is there anything else that you've been working on that we can look out for or um, upcoming projects or anything i mean yeah uh there was a film i just did in china called 1921 but i don't think that's going to be coming out over here yeah <laughs> um <laughs> bloody hell uh, yeah so that's a crazy one celebrating 100 years of communism in china that's a little um, bit different from the and, we, and we didn't even get to talk about like how you kept yourself entertained for two weeks while you were locked in a hotel room i'll tell you this they're doing quarantine and covid19 very differently in china and they also really? have no new cases over there wow um and but they are really strict and i had to stay in the craziest uh, quarantine hotel with like everybody in hazmat suits 
and gas masks. Well, they didn't have gas masks, but they had like masks yeah. and goggles and like the whole shield and everything, and a lot of a lot of this with the, the nose nasty swap. <laughs> the cokey cheeky <laughs> bastard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 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 so imagine, yeah I can't imagine game. you'll be seeing that one uh, yeah. out over here anytime soon. Right, oh, uh, shit. but I've I've got a TV show that I'm about to start, which I was supposed to start in January, but I'm starting in um, prep in January of 2021, and nice. we're filming in Very March cool. through to the end of the year. It's called Daisy Jones and the Six, which I'm really excited about. I'm going to be rocking that neutral American accent. Yeah, yeah, all right, um, wicked. So it's all finished. Player. Oh, no, it's not. Awesome. I haven't even started it yet. Yeah. Oh, you haven't started it. Okay. Yeah. I thought you said it was coming out. Okay, so you're about to tape no, it in January. Yeah. It'll be out in nice. 2022, and we're just gotcha. about to start that now. Um, Yo, really quickly, as an actor, let me pick your brain on this. So, I, I, did you watch the, the new Borat movie? No, not yet, but I've been meaning to. Okay, I'm not going to spoil it for you then. But they did a lot of the filming during COVID, which was fucking crazy to me. Um, I don't understand how some people turn around shit so quickly because we're, you know, we've got, we're dabbling in this TV thing at the moment. And it seems like the longest process to me from when something starts, mm. then you got to get the script, then you got to do the table, then you got to get the casting, then you got to start shooting the shit. They turn this shit around so quickly. What's the normal mm. sort of turnaround time? So you said the night before Christmas took a month Pre-COVID. to film the whole thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, pre-COVID. Like, depending on the project and how they're doing it and how much money they have and all of that. Right. Um, Night Before Christmas was really quick, man. Like, wow. they, we did a 30-day shoot. But what generally happens is every day, whatever you're shooting, gets taken straight to the editor and they do a rough edit of that mm-hmm. day. Wow. And then every day they start compiling the film. So they've got a rough edit of the film by the, the 30th day of you shooting. Oh, that's sick. And then they go straight into an edit with the director where the director will then add all the sound, special effects, and then do the coloring. And, you know, then you've got to do your ADR, dub, dub yourself if any of the lines don't work Oh, that's right. a great thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you just, I'm so glad you touched on that. Did you know that in a lot of the Indian movies, the Bollywood movies, they have to dub the entire film afterwards? Yeah, right. Like this is a three hour movie. They've acted the whole shit out. And they're like, okay, so now just go and do the dubbing. They're like, mm-hmm. what? For three hours? In fact, That's when I did we were my. Doing with the Chinese film I just did, actually. There you go. Um, dubbing the whole thing. And it's because they had budget, partly, mm. but also because there was a lot of background noise. Um, a lot of the time but yeah no that's a, it's a crazy thing but that's what a whole other skill that's a whole other skill that you have to do because i could probably run act up. in the moment yeah. Yeah. yeah in the moment i could be like, blah, 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 and do, execute like fuck yes i nailed that and the timings and the stuff and then you got to nail that and lip sync it that's a whole other shit that's mm-hmm. that's a whole other sort yeah. of skill set you need to use yeah man no i i call it whack-a-mole do you remember that game <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, where they pop up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you That's just got to like watch your lips I, and execute. Yeah, yeah or like guitar hero, but with your mouth. And you're just like yeah. waiting for it. And then, no, <laughs> and then you can just kind of like black out and go into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So many, if you bro. nail it, if you nail yeah. it, then it's really satisfying. And then you watch it back. You're like, whoa, I got it just <laughs> like it was. And it's also a nice opportunity if you didn't say something that well or that cool. Perhaps you can like right. make yourself sound better. Um, gotcha. But yeah, no, dubbing is a is a fun one. But I think like night before Christmas, we shot that in June, and it was out by December. Um, wow. You know? Yeah, June, that's July, quick. It was out by Wait, December. So just quickly. So what was the was... What, what was the snow made of then? <laughs> uh, it was like foam. I love Brilliant. that stuff. It's like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. And there's a scene where I'm like out in the street. Yeah. They call it murder. No, that, that was. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, Brilliant. <laughs> uh, there's a scene where I'm out in the street and I'm, it's like right at the beginning of the movie and I get hit by a car. And they had. Yeah. Um, I was in my armor and they had this. It was freezing cold, three o'clock in the morning. Because um, it was cold over there at that time. Mm. Night still, mm-hmm. like the lake was frozen, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't snowing. But they had this uh, foam machine shooting foam out, and then they had, you know, those boats that get pushed forward by a fan. Oh, the the Florida, Massive, the fan boats. Huge, huge yeah. fan. Yeah, like a hundred mm-hmm. mile an hour wind. Mm-hmm. So there was a guy sitting on one of those, one of those fans, just like, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> we were just like, 
<laughs> trying to it's all go in your eyes and like in your mouth it doesn't normally snow this way does it yeah so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> well it's good they did that because i had a friend that used to work in bbc props back in the 80s and 90s used to work on red dwarf and they used to use a uh, purcell they used to use a dish uh, as in a uh, laundry detergent so he goes at the end of the day yeah. literally you just your eyes would be red it would be up your nose he goes no pint tasted right at the end of the day you could just be like oh i can taste this soap it's just like uh, that yeah. is that's so funny, man. Yeah. Well, bro, thank you, man. I've loved this chat. I hope you've enjoyed Same, it too, bro. Fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Okay, to touch you, man. Nice to meet you over the internet. I'm sure. Yes, we'll exactly. A hundred percent. Next time I'm out there. Oh, well, yeah, I don't know. You might be back in England, but either way, we'll try to connect, man. That'd be wicked. Awesome, dude. And good to see you, Woody boy. Thank- Yep, and bro, um, your socials, if you want, if you want to plug them. Yeah, my Instagram is Joshua Whitehouse, all one word. Uh, Perfect. That'll do. It's the only thing I really use. Twitter I don't really use, but that's Josh is a tree. Okay. And okay. More Like Trees, where can we find your music? Oh, uh, well, More Like Trees is on Spotify. Uh, we've got a new album out, actually. Yeah, I should plug the music. Uh, got, um, yes. got More Like Trees, got two albums out with those guys, and... Uh, We've got uh, got an album out through a band called High Cross Society as well, which features uh, Reaps on it as well, and Lazy Habits and Fiocra. Uh, We released that years ago, but uh, that's out there. So there's music to find. And I got some stuff out under my personal name as well, if you want to check out what I've been up to on the side of things. There you go, mate. Keeping busy. Loving it. Lovely stuff. Good good stuff. Good to talk to you guys, man. Thanks for having me Like what? Of course, bro. All right, guys and fellas, I would chat to you in a bit. Josh, thank you, mate. Stay safe. Absolutely. You too. All right, brother. All right, take care, guys. Peace. Bye, guys. Bye, bye, bye. Peace.